All right, we're just about three minutes out from the start of our meeting at 630. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Please hang on. We'll get started promptly at 630. All right, good evening. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Harris County Flood Control District's virtual community engagement meeting to discuss the feasibility study of stormwater conveyance tunnels. This virtual meeting is being offered by the Flood Control District to share vital information with the community. I'm Sparkle Bell with the Flood Control District Communications Team, and I'm joined tonight by a team of Flood Control District leadership and subject matter experts to ensure we continue to keep you up to date on these important flood mitigation projects in your community. We are joined by staff from area elected officials, offices, and community associations. And we're so glad to see the community so engaged in the study. And we look forward to continuing to share updates and keeping you all in the community involved. This virtual public meeting will begin with a presentation to share study updates, including what we know so far about tunnels and how the tunnel investigation will continue. The presentations will be followed by a virtual question and answer session with flood control district team members. Attendees will be able to submit comments and questions through the website or via phone. Any comments not addressed during the Q&A session will receive a response from the flood control district following the close of the public comment period. Instructions on how to participate in this virtual open house are included on this slide, on the virtual meeting webpage, and on the district's website. I will also share a reminder of these instructions when we reach the Q&A portion of the meeting. We will now transition to Scott Elmer, Assistant Director of Operations with the Flood Control District, who will share information about the district and this study. Scott, over to you. Thank you, Sparkle. Appreciate it. And thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. In this presentation, we will give you a brief overview of this study. Before we get to study specifics though, we want to share some information about the Flood Control District. The Harris County Flood Control District is a special purpose district created by the Texas legislature in 1937 in response to the dev devastating floods that hit the Houston area in 1929 and 1935. The Flood Control District is governed by the Harris County Commissioner's Court and works closely with other entities in our region, such as the Harris County Engineering Department and the City of Houston. The organization was created in part to serve as a local partner to leverage federal funding for flood damage reduction projects. 
Our mission has expanded since our founding, leading to billions of dollars in federal, state, and locally funded infrastructure improvements in the ground. The mission of the Harris County Flood Control District is to provide flood damage reduction projects that work with the appropriate regard for community and natural values. One of the most difficult challenges we face is constructing effective projects that are sensitive to community and natural values in a highly urbanized area. Harris County includes 23 main watersheds totaling approximately 1,800 square miles and more than 2,500 linear miles of channel. 2,500 miles is approximately the distance from New York to California. A watershed is a geographical region of land that drains to a common channel or outlet. Each watershed has its own unique characteristics and needs. Tonight, we're going to talk about a study that spans the entire county. Our area is flood prone. Here are some reasons why. We are prone to extreme rainfall, including tropical storms and hurricanes. We have a flat, slow draining landscape and our clay soils do not soak up excess rainfall quickly. Partnership funding is an important aspect of our work. The graphic here illustrates the many sources of federal, state, and local funding that Flood Control District is working to secure for Harris County. Each agency has its own definition of eligible projects and its own requirements for local match funding. So now it is my pleasure to introduce to you the Flood Control District's evaluation of a large diameter tunnel system for stormwater conveyance and what it could bring to Harris County. Today, we will share what we know about a technology that continues to advance and how it could help us tackle the challenges of reducing flooding in a growing community where flooding is a year round threat. So here is what we wanna to cover today. We want to provide a brief overview of stormwater drainage in Harris County. We want to show you how a tunnel works and how a tunnel is constructed. We want to go over the results of our phase one study on the feasibility of stormwater conveyance tunnels. We want to talk about our phase two results and we want to tell you about the work ahead in phase three. And most importantly, we want to tell you how to provide input into these studies. The addition of a large diameter underground tunnel system to our stormwater management network has the potential to significantly reduce flood risk in densely populated areas of Harris County. This presentation will outline what we have learned so far and the work ahead. We began with a very simple question. Can large diameter tunnels be built underground in the soft soils of Harris County? The answer was yes. We also found that in some watersheds, a tunnel may not move enough water using gravity to make a difference over traditional flood reduction methods. Flooding is a fact of life in Harris County. In the United States, Floods have caused a greater loss of life and property and have disrupted more families and communities than all other natural hazards by far. It does not take a catastrophic event to create flooding that results in catastrophic losses. So next, we'll see the floodplain map that is in effect today. It will show you the area of inundation for major storms. You can see the floodway in dark blue, the 1% or the 100 year floodplain in lighter blue, and in the greenish color, you'll see the 0.2% or the 500 year floodplain. Some of our earliest reports of flooding in Texas include records made by Spanish explorers in the 1600s. 
and a storm in 1818 that washed away Jean Lafitte's encampment on Galveston Island. And in this timeline, which is on our website, it tells us that major storms and flooding have been harassing Harris County since 1900. In the previous century, 25 storms caused major flooding. In this century, there have already been 10 storms with significant flooding. These storms include Allison, Ike, Memorial Day in 2015, Tax Day in 2016, Harvey in 2017, and Amelda in 2019. The next slide illustrates how stormwater can be moved or stored in Harris County. Our goal is to safely move stormwater away from flood prone areas. Inside neighborhoods, as shown on the left side of this illustration, storm sewers and roadside ditches collect stormwater runoff and start the process of moving it away from streets and homes. The larger bayous and channels that take the collected stormwater and move it through our drainage system to Galveston Bay are shown on the right side of the illustration. In the middle is a stormwater detention basin sometimes constructed by the Flood Control District, sometimes by other agencies. These basins provide a place to temporarily hold stormwater until it can safely drain away. Channels and basins are the tools that we have historically used to reduce flooding for the past 80 years. Today, channels and basins are more cost effective than tunnels in areas that have available land. By adding tunnels to the existing stormwater management network, we increase the volume of water that can be moved out of areas that have a history of flooding. Every day, the Harris County Flood Control District is working to find additional ways to increase the amount of stormwater that can be moved from flood prone areas. So when we consider our flood damage reduction tools, we have to think about location and population density. As we mentioned in the introduction to this meeting, one of the most difficult challenges the Flood Control District faces is constructing effective projects that are sensitive to community and natural values in highly urbanized areas. So here is an example from just outside the loop in near North Houston. It's the Cross Timbers area. This first photo is 1930. There is plenty of open land, and at this point, there was no planned drainage system. The next photo is 1953. As you can see in this photo, only 23 years later, significant development has already occurred. To some extent, Harris County's current flooding issues are an inherited problem. Much of Harris County was developed before our current understanding of flood risk and the development regulations that resulted from that understanding of flood risk. So next, we will see the same location in 2021. In this example location, it is easy to see that it would be difficult to expand this channel to increase its capacity or to add the necessary stormwater detention. There simply isn't much open space available. When you combine densely populated areas with the year round threat of heavy rainfall, the takeaway is the job of flood risk reduction has become more challenging. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to stay of density. Here's an example of what a neighborhood density looks like in many places throughout the county. You can see that we have homes backed up to the drainage facility. If we needed to increase the stormwater capacity of this channel, we would need more land to do so. So here, between the red lines, is the area that we might need to expand the channel. As you can see, 
This would involve buying out and demolishing many homes, possibly for several miles. And this does not include adding any additional property for necessary stormwater detention to mitigate for the channel expansion and the increased stormwater flow. Home buyouts are very, very disruptive to people, to neighborhoods, to our community. They're expensive and they take time. Given recent large storms like Harvey, community expectations are evolving. We are hearing requests for bigger solutions to balance the challenges of density and very large rainfall events. And that is what this investigation of large diameter tunnels is all about. So how much land do we need to reduce flooding? Tunnels we have found would require much less surface land than our traditional flood risk reduction projects. To help us understand how much surface land would be needed for various flood damage reduction approaches, we have created this abstract visual. As you can see here, tunnels and channel improvements would likely require less land than stormwater basins or buyouts to achieve the same level of service. This comparison of acres of land needed is based on one representative preliminary tunnel alignment and is used here to illustrate the magnitude of the difference. It is important to note, and I'll say it often, this information is simply to help you understand how these flood risk reduction solutions compare. In real life, a flood risk reduction project would use a combination of these tools. This information will vary for every tunnel alignment in our, in our system. However, we expect to consistently see that sorry, tunnels and channels are the options that would have the lowest impact on communities and cause the least disruption to the built and natural environments. Remember, the stormwater management network we have today is dynamic. If we add a tunnel system, we increase the capacity of that network and we make it even more dynamic. And remember, this graphic is for comparative purposes only. A typical flood risk reduction project would use a combination of these tools rather than a single one to achieve our flood risk reduction goals. So why are we studying tunnels now? First, there's a countywide need for additional stormwater conveyance. Constraints like the lack of open land make it more costly and more impactful to pursue channel improvements. And as tunnel technology has advanced, tunnel construction costs have come down and we are now looking at a system of tunnels as a feasible and potentially cost-effective means of achieving flood risk reduction with the appropriate regard for community and natural values. Up to this point in our study, we have looked at whether a tunnel system could operate in Harris County using gravity, and we have confirmed that it can. Harris County slightly slopes towards Galveston Bay. The change in elevation from about 244 feet from the highest point to sea level is enough to convey a substantial amount of stormwater. This means that when it rains, gravity has the ability to move stormwater into and along a tunnel system towards the ship channel or Galveston Bay. And we would use this slope to our advantage in areas where tunnels are most effective. As part of our next phase, we wanna take a look at what we call active stormwater management within a tunnel system, specifically, we will weigh the benefits of optimizing the performance of the system by including pump conveyance. So what do we mean when we talk about large diameter tunnels? We estimate that a future tunnel system would be between 30 and 45 feet in diameter. For comparison, in this image, you see people standing inside a 12 foot diameter pipe. This is typical of a larger storm sewer in Harris County. The broad majority of storm sewers are much smaller. For a size comparison, here's an example. The inside of the new Memorial Park Tunnel is 25 feet high and 54 feet wide. We also estimate 
that tunnels might be between 80 to 100 feet underground and constructed by boring underground as compared to storm sewers that are typically four to eight feet underground and laid by means of a surface trench. So what is the potential for conveyance of a large diameter tunnel? Here's a typical cross section of one of our largest bayous. When the stormwater fills the channel to the bank full stage, it is conveying 15,800 cubic feet of stormwater per second. As a reference, a cubic foot is about the size of a basketball. The inlets would allow water to transfer to the tunnel system. The flow rate of one 40 foot diameter tunnel is between 11,000 and 13,000 cubic feet per second. This animation shows how we've made room to move more water away from an area that floods frequently. A tunnel makes room for more storm water. So let's take another look at how tunnels and channels could work together. As a channel fills up in heavy rain, once storm water reaches a certain level, it would drain into strategically placed inlets. Each tunnel would have several inlets, the inlets are located above the ordinary high water mark. Water moves through the tunnel to a downstream outlet that also would be strategically placed. The infrastructure would be designed and built so that as water leaves the tunnel, no negative impacts can occur. The goal is to arrest rising water levels by carrying extreme rain flow safely underground. As you can see, the inlets are above the base flow in the channel. This way, the water surface elevation is maintained to keep a healthy natural environment. With the addition of the tunnel, we now have two paths for stormwater to travel during a heavy rain event, which means our conveyance capacity increases significantly. In short, areas with tunnels will become more resilient. Tunnels are already a proven method in other major Texas cities. The photos here show the outfall infrastructure for the San Antonio River Tunnel. As we have seen in San Antonio, Austin, and now Dallas, tunnels can be safely excavated and operated deep underground in Texas. There are differences, of course. In Dallas, for example, soil conditions consist of stone and rock. In Harris County, our soils are clays and sands, and they would require a different construction technology. So let's take a look at how the tunnels work. So here's a cross section of a tunnel with stormwater flowing from left to right. Rising water in the bayou enters the tunnel by way of multiple surface inlets, connecting to our existing stormwater management network. Gravity then moves the stormwater out by ways of the outfall shaft. So now we wanna take a look at how large diameter underground tunnels are actually constructed. This video is provided by Heron Connect. The method of constructing the tunnel consists of two parts, cutting the path of the tunnel and building the permanent wall of the tunnel. So let's start by looking at how the tunnel alignment is dug deep underground with minimal disturbance to neighborhoods, roads, cultural and natural resources. A shaft is created at the starting point of the tunnel and the custom designed tunnel boring machine is lowered in pieces and assembled approximately 100 feet below ground to begin the process. At the left, you can see a rotating orange cutting wheel that is moving earthen material into a chamber where a screw auger withdraws the excavated material at a controlled rate using a belt conveyor. This conveyor is shown diagonally in orange. Another conveyor then moves the soil to the tunnel exit. Next, you'll briefly see the exterior tunnel shield that protects the boring process. The hydraulic cylinders relocate to make room to create the tunnel wall. Reinforced concrete segments known as lining segments are installed under the protection of the shield skin. When the permanent tunnel wall segment is complete, the machine can then push itself against the new tunnel ring and drill further into the soil. 
So what do we know so far? We know that the disruption to homes, buildings, roads, trees, and wildlife appears to be significantly less with underground tunnel construction as compared to the disruption that often must accompany the construction of surface channel modifications or stormwater detention basins. Now that we understand how a tunnel works and how it will be constructed, let's look into more detail at what we found in our phase one and our phase two study process. In phase one, which we considered a go, no go phase, we had to answer two key questions. Can we build tunnels successfully in Harris County soft soils? The answer was yes, we can. Can the tunnels move enough stormwater by gravity to make a difference? Again, the answer was yes. Harris County Flood Control District funded this study through a $320,000 grant from the U.S. Economic Development Administration and an $80,000 cost share from the Flood Control District. We completed and shared the information for this study on our website in September 2019, and you can read more about it on our project page on our website. Feedback from the public so far has been a mix of support and some concern, with almost all asking for additional information that we considered in phase two, and we will consider further in phase three. As we turned to phase two and studied potential tunnel alignments, there were several considerations. And in a moment, we will look at a few of these considerations. Given that this is the first time a large diameter underground tunnel system has been studied in Harris County on this scale, we wanna share our approach in some detail. First, we identified the watershed that met the criteria for a tunnel. Next, we identified flood damage centers that presented the highest risk. We considered life safety. We identified strategic locations for intakes and for outfalls. Intakes maximize the flood reduction benefits and outfalls need the space to minimize impacts to the receiving body of water. We also look for opportunities to integrate tunnels with existing and proposed flood damage reduction systems, including stormwater detention and stream channel modifications. We avoided geologic and man-made hazards such as oil and gas wells, faults, and deep structural foundations. The phase two analysis cost 2.5 million and was entirely funded by a federal housing and urban development grant. We have reserved $20 million in the 2018 Harris County bond funds to continue our study. So we wanna look at this in more detail. The countywide analysis began with one very, very important assumption. And that was that every watershed could, pot, could benefit from a tunnel. Very important assumption, we assume that every watershed had the potential to benefit from a tunnel. We considered which watersheds had the elevation to move stormwater through a tunnel, and we looked at numerous other factors. And this process helped us narrow down 23 Harris County watersheds to 11 in which tunnels could successfully function. One of the factors we looked at was population density. We looked at rainfall, <clears throat> pardon me, we looked at rainfall countywide and we identified places where the deepest and most frequent flooding has and will continue to occur. We identified those areas as damage centers. A flood damage center is a concentrated area that has and will continue to flood repeatedly with water in homes and businesses. Think of flood damage centers as an area where flooding hits a critical mass. Our goal was to identify areas that have the highest risk and the best potential for a tunnel to be beneficial. To do this, we looked at existing structures at risk in a 1% 100-year storm event, but we didn't simply count the structures. We also looked at the instances of structure flooding over time, the cumulative effect of flooding. We assess how often each structure might flood over time because reducing repetitive flooding is very, very beneficial. Looking at the cumulative instances of flooding, 
means that we understand that not all neighborhoods are the same. This allows us to identify areas that flood most frequently with the most stormwater. Tunnels will be most beneficial if they can reduce flooding where damage centers are located. So here's the reveal. Here you see a potential tunnel system. The tunnels in this system are aligned to address damage centers in areas where a tunnel would likely result in less community disruption than traditional projects and would increase resiliency. Remember, what you see is a line on a map. The benefit area of a tunnel is larger than that line. Tunnels could potentially lower the backwater conditions for tributaries that feed into the main watershed channel. In all, there are eight full tunnel alignments serving about half of the county, potentially benefiting the entire county. In alphabetical order, they are Bray's Bayou, Buffalo Bayou, Clear Creek, Berry, and Bent's Bayous, Greens, Halls, and Hunting Bayou, Halls and Hunting Bayou, Little Cypress Creek, Cypress Creek, Sims Bayou, and White Oak Bayou. You will see that there are areas of the county that do not have a potential tunnel alignment. This is because we believe that other methods of flood damage reduction like channel conveyance improvements are more effective in these areas. Some flood damage reduction projects are already in progress in these areas and areas downstream from tunnels will also have benefits from tunnels as well. It is important to note that at this time in today's dollars, we estimate the cost of the tunnel system to be $30 billion and that's billion what they be. We also estimate that the tunnel system has the potential to reduce 80,000 to 120,000 cumulative instances of flooding for all storm events up to and including the 1% or 100 year storm event. That means 80,000 to 120,000 cumulative instances of flooding are avoided over the life of the tunnel, which is approximately 100 years. Again, in considering the cost benefit of each tunnel alignment, we think this is an important distinction because in some areas, homes flood easily and multiple times in storms much smaller than the 1% or 100 year storm event. What is not shown, but it's also important to understand is that tens of thousands of additional structures would see less severe flooding if a tunnel system is constructed. So here is a summary for each tunnel alignment within the potential system. Here you see the length in miles and the diameter of the tunnel in feet. Each tunnel would have one outlet where the stormwater leaves the tunnel. There would be anywhere from one to six inlets that allow stormwater to flow into the tunnel. The estimated stormwater conveyance is provided in cubic feet per second or basketballs per second if you prefer that. The range in ground cover is also provided. Ground cover refers to the depth of soil above the tunnel crown and along the tunnel length. So today we see the advantages of a tunnel system compared to the traditional system as follows. We expand the options for flood damage reduction. We make our stormwater network more robust. We reduce community disruption and increase community resilience. And we have a reduced environmental impact. Here's an additional way to take a look at the benefits of a tunnel system. Adding a tunnel system provides additional conveyance of stormwater. Underground construction minimizes disruptive home buyouts. And because of a reduction in surface land acquisition, we anticipate that tunnels can be delivered in a shorter time frame than traditional methods such as channel modification. A couple of additional considerations. Criteria for federal funding continues to evolve. And as we mentioned earlier, we consider $30 billion in today's dollars to be the ballpark for a tunnel system. So we want to pause here and give you a few points to remember. New technology often involves learning as you implement. 
a tunnel system would be an addition to our existing stormwater management network, not a replacement to it. All of our tools, drainage system improvement, channel modifications, basins, and potentially tunnels will be needed in the future. Weather is always unpredictable. Flooding is always a possibility in Harris County and everyone should purchase flood insurance. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we're only part of the way through our investigation. So we need to spend a few minutes on where we're headed. We aren't ready to declare a tunnel system a must do option in Harris County quite yet. We have additional work to do. That additional work is what we're gonna call our phase three study. As part of our phase three study, we need to work with the community to understand the need and the desire for this type of solution. This is very, very important to us. We will be advancing the design, we'll be quantifying the benefits, and we will be investigating funding sources. Community understanding and support are key to being able to bring large diameter underground tunnels to Harris County. It is our job to make sure you understand how and where tunnels make sense. Public input will inform our project team as we continue to evaluate the system. And measuring public support will be critical to securing funding. Overall, we are analyzing about 130 miles of a potential tunnel system, and we will be digging deeper. This analysis involves evaluating how tunnels will integrate into our existing and planned channels and basins, Evaluate, excuse me, evaluating ways to mitigate impacts downstream of tunnel outlets. For example, the Port of Houston and the Flood Control District will be working closely together as part of our phase three evaluation. We'll be finalizing a potential tunnel system that provides the greatest flood damage reduction benefits in a manner that considers cost and funding. And we'll be quantifying those flood damage reduction benefits. We are also looking forward to the analysis of comprehensive benefits countywide. This is where we will be building a business case for funding a tunnel system. So here are some examples of how a tunnel system could ben potentially benefit the entire county and where we need to do further research to quantify those benefits. We will look at the national and regional economic development considerations. We will study what we think will be the positive impact socially and environmentally of fewer buyouts and less flood damage to roads, houses, and businesses. One of our major goals is to improve resiliency in Harris County. We want to help people bounce back after a major storm event. Bottom line, it is important that we define the true benefits that make our community more resilient without losing community cohesion and improve the county's overall life safety response during storm events. As with every project, we will have to explore funding sources. Given the size and the scale of a preliminary tunnel system, our final plan must qualify for state and federal funding and it is likely that county funding will be required as well. So reviewing the phase three study areas. Most important, we'll be working with the community to understand the need and the desire for this type of solution. We'll be advancing the design, quantifying the benefits and investigating funding sources. So here is where we are at today. We are presenting our phase two findings and we're asking for your input. Your input will be used to guide our phase three work and we hope to begin phase three in early 2023. We have $20 million in 2018 bond funding to apply to this phase of the study. Thank you for your time today. We hope you're interested in this study and will continue to be part of the public input process as we move forward. I will now turn the conversation back over to Sparkle to kick off the question and answer. 
Thanks, Scott. Before we move into the Q&A, I want to share a quick reminder that we'd love to hear from you on this and other projects moving forward across the county. To learn more about the study, to ask questions, or to sign up for our mailing list, please visit hcfcd.org forward slash tunnels. As a reminder, there are three ways to submit a comment about this study during tonight's session. You can submit a comment on the site in the box near the presentation live stream, which so many of you are doing. You can also submit a comment on the Flood Control District's website at the URL I mentioned earlier, hcfcd.org forward slash tunnels, or you can submit a comment via phone at 855 925-2801 using the meeting code 9622. If you're joining us via phone tonight, please press star six to leave a message. Additionally, it is important to note that any questions received by September 30th, the close of the formal public comment period, will be used to inform our phase three study. And I want to reiterate, that any questions not addressed during tonight's Q&A session will receive a response from the Flood Control District following the close of the public comment period. Information from this meeting and a recording of the live stream will be available on the Flood Control District's website and our YouTube channel. Joining Scott Elmer for our Q&A session tonight is Engineering Project Manager Tommy Jo Scott, who is also helping oversee this study. And now it's time to take some of your questions. Our first question for the night is for you, Tommy Joe, and it is um, actually a comment. <laughs> we are getting some questions from people who have recently flooded, asking for a tunnel to benefit their particular neighborhood. What can you tell them about this at this time? Yeah, so what I'll start with is, uh, flooding has been a major issue in Harris County. So there are many ways to go about it, and tunnels is just one of the ones we are trying to pursue. Um, and we're not the only ones who are looking at it. Um, so if we want to go to actually slide 16, this can kind of give you a, an overall look of how the tunnels would be working together with some of the city and municipal projects that are more in the neighborhoods and some of our shared jurisdiction projects. For example, if we have any detention basins, which may also have some parks and, and whatnot. And then also where our tunnels would be, which would be in our flood control jurisdiction, which would be complementing the existing channels out there. Um, one of the good things about the tunnels is that it would be providing more capacity to to the system and also more resiliency to recover from those from, from those storms. Um, and one of the benefits of that is now there's more capacity in the channels. And so there's more uh, backwater that can be reduced and now water can get out of those neighborhoods quicker. Uh, now, it isn't, again, it isn't uh, a solution for everything and, and tunnels is something we still have to continue. and how the neighborhood system works with those tunnels, that's something we're definitely gonna be investigating as part of phase three. All right, Scott, our next question is for you. We're getting several questions from people asking how tunnels would help our work with their particular neighborhood drainage issues. Can you talk about how tunnels would interact with neighborhood drainage systems? Scott, you're muted. Apologies. Uh, thank you, Sparkle. This is kind of tied into what the previous question was about. Um, when you look at tunnels, you got to look at them as a conveyance system, just like one of our major bayous, White Oak, Braze, Halls, they're conveyance systems. And all the local drainage system ties into these major outfall channels. As you reduce the water surface elevations through the use of that additional conveyance that would be provided by a tunnel, then that should have a positive impact on that local drainage system's ability to drain. There's a lot more detail that has to go into it as part of our phase three study, but right now we would expect that additional conveyance, that reduction in the water surface elevation in those major stream channels to have a positive impact on local drainage systems. All right, thank you for that. Tommy Joe. will you take this next question, please? It is, what would you do with the spoils? Okay, I'm going to use the visual from slide 23. 
And I'm going to take a quick step back to explain what spoil is. Um, so generally what it means is when we're having to build this tunnel, you have to actually pull out the dirt that's there right now. And there's a some of it can go back in when we are finished with the construction, but some of it has to be pulled out permanently. And we can't just stick it on the side of the of the channel because that that's a that's a problem we have um, our rain rain events that come through and the channels would rise. So we typically have to put that extra soil somewhere. And that's usually on a placement area outside of the 500 year floodplain. Now, determining where those placement areas are, that's usually part of the uh, NEPA process, which is the Environmental Protection Agency permitting process. And that would be done in a, in a future phase of this project. Um, those sites, again, have not been determined at this point, um, and, and those will be determined later. Um, now, there are also alternatives where during construction, the contractor may choose an alternate site because, hey, it's now been several years later, and that site doesn't, doesn't work when, of what we looked at during the NEPA process. They will still have to go back and go through that NEPA process again to make sure, hey, we are still in compliance, even with the latest policies that are out there. All right. Thank you, Tommy Joe. Mm -hmm. Scott, will you take the next question? It is, we've received some questions about tunnel maintenance and sedimentation. Will the tunnels be regularly cleaned out and how? Sure. Maintenance is a fact of life for all of our stormwater management facilities, uh, whether they're a stormwater detention basin or whether they're a, a channel or whether potentially a tunnel in the future. So there would be routine inspections and there would be dewatering of the tunnel system between storm events. And those routine inspections of the tunnel would keep an eye on how much sedimentation may build up in the tunnel. And then there would have to be periodic cleaning of that tunnel, whether it's for debris removal or whether it's for sedimentation removal. But when you normally design a facility like this, you design it assuming there's a certain minimal level of maintenance, uh, sorry, a certain minimal level of sedimentation that is in the tunnel. So you don't have that taking up its capacity at any time. But yes, there would be routine inspections and routine cleanouts. All right, thanks. Tommy, Joe, our next question is for you. One of our viewers is very interested to learn how the flood water might be brought back above grade and oxygenated before being discharged into the receiving body of water. Can you talk through that, please? Yeah, so I'm perfect. Y'all went to the slide already. So I'm going to go through a little bit how the water gets in. Um, so, uh, so the water is going to come from the surface and then go down into the tunnels themselves. And then the water is going to be pushed through by gravity, and then it will go out um, on the far right you see on the screen. Um, at the end of the storm, there will, there will potentially be water still in the tunnel system. And that's the concern where they were saying about uh, the dissolved oxygen. And so to handle that, uh, we are planning to use pumps, or potentially using pumps, to push that water back out between storms. Um, we don't want the situation to occur when a storm comes through and if we leave the water there and that water, that dissolved oxygen water be pushed out and that's not, not good at all. So we definitely want to be maintaining the system um, and making sure it's working properly and that includes clear, clearing out the water uh, to not get it into a stagnant uh, position. All right, Scott, how will tunnels work when there is a storm surge? Sure. When we calculated our different elevations between inlet and outlet points, what we utilized for the outlet elevation was we took the Hurricane Ike storm surge, the largest storm surge we've seen to date. We added three feet to it and said that would be the minimum elevation for an outlet. We also, on those uh, outlet structures, would have a series of flap gates to prevent any storm surge from being able to back charge the tunnel system and push water upstream on the tunnel system. So it still needs further refinement in phase three, but that was our initial uh, plan for handling and addressing storm surge. All right, thank you. Tommy Joe, we're receiving questions suggesting that these tunnels might be multi-use for transportation or other uses. Has that been considered? 
Not yet. Um, so we're just still looking to see if, it, if, if tunnels work in Harris County. So one of the next things in phase three is looking, okay, is there something else that we could potentially do? And right now, again, we're flood control district, so we're focusing on flood control. Um, but if something does get pulled in, that's something that may require a partnership. And that can also complica complicate how we secure funding for the project. So there are some issues if we start making it multi-use. Mm -hmm. All right, we are receiving several questions about non tunnel projects. Um, any questions that are not responded to during this Q&A session will receive a response following the close of the public comment period. You also have the opportunity if you have questions that aren't related to this particular study to visit our website and submit a question to us there and you can also receive a response that way. Okay, Scott, our next question is for you. How much future sea level rise is taken into account in this analysis? In our phase two analysis, what we looked at our outfalls, as I said, was Hurricane Ike plus three feet. That has some measure of sea level rise, but we didn't do a true sea level rise analysis as part of phase two. When we conduct phase three, we would be conducting phase three as a federally compliant study. So at the end of phase three, that study would then be eligible for potential sources of federal funding. Phase three is where we would go into more detail and taking a look at incorporating sea level rise into our analysis on that. You've got to remember, we're at a point in a continuum on our process right now. We started with our phase one, which was a proof of concept. We're at phase two, where we have a potential system that we need to now refine and start looking at in phase three for the more detailed analysis of that system. All right, great. Scott, will you take this next question as well? Can the tunnels be made even larger? Today, with today's technology, what we're looking at on the upper limits for soft ground tunneling technology is about 45 feet. Um, there's going to be a curve um, that you'll start running into. As you increase the diameter of tunnels during construction, you increase cost. And you start running into a drop off on capturing benefits versus dramatically increasing cost. So we're looking at really an upper limit on today's technology of about 45 foot in diameter, but we'll be trying to make those um, diameters cost effective where we're we're capturing the greatest amount of flood reduction benefits at the most effective cost, but 45 feet is about the upper limit. All right, Scott, there are several questions about how each tunnel would help specific areas. What can we tell people about that tonight? Um, the best thing to do is to download the report. <laughs> I know it's, it's got a lot of information in it, but there are some detail on flood damage centers in our report. We are not at the level in today's level of study that we can point out exactly where and exactly how, because we're at that point on the continuum. We still got a lot of engineering left to do, but there is more detail in the report on our flood damage centers and the location of the flood damage centers and the impact of structures on these and flooding in these flood damage centers on that, but there's a lot of detail left to be worked out. So I really can't say much on specifics when it comes to neighborhoods, areas, or communities tonight. All right, Scott, we have a, received a couple of questions suggesting that stormwater be used in drought stricken areas or pumped into reservoirs. Has that been considered? That has not uh, been considered to date. Um, the issue with this stormwater is it's not a consistent source of, of water. It, it all depends upon storm events. And remember, it's not, tunnels will not be active in every storm event on that. So it's not a consistent source of water uh, for any use. And there's a whole timing issue of getting rid of the water. You've got to get it out in a very short amount of time. And if we would build reservoirs, then you're taking up that same amount of land that the water would, that the, the tunnels will avoid. 
and that whole impact on land. So I don't know that that's really um, a proven concept at this time. All right, tell me, Joe, have we considered any other options besides tunnels? So the answer is yes. So again, um, tunnels is not the only tool in the toolbox as, as that saying goes. So I'm gonna have y'all go to slide 19. And this kind of gives you a general overview of how tunnels work in some areas. Um, so in some areas, tunnels, if there's enough elevation, if, if there is enough damage centers, um, and there's a few other, like if it's super, super urbanized, then uh, there may be a better uh, need for a tunnel versus stormwater detention or expanding the channel. If there's not enough elevation or there's more open land, um, then it may not be the most um, efficient use of funds. And that's, again, something still we're trying to work through, and that's something we're going to be investigating further in phase three. I'm receiving quite a few comments about when the public comment period concludes, and it concludes on September 30th. That's the close of the formal public comment period, um, and those comments will be used to inform our phase three study. So you have some time to give us your feedback. Um, we truly value your engagement tonight. Okay, our next question is for you, Tommy Joe. Can you go over the cost information for tunnels? How much per mile or a typical tunnel alignment and how long would they take to build once, once funding is received? Ooh, that's a, that's a lot of questions. So Scott, jump in when if I missed one. So I, um, I can take it if you want, Tommy Joe. Yeah, let, why don't you take it? You have it more memorized than I do sure. on this one. <laughs> a good representative 10 mile section of tunnel. You know, if you look at, the exhibit we had earlier in the slide, we had tunnels ranging from about eight miles to about 25 miles. If you take a 10 mile segment of tunnel, then you're looking at a, a cost, a construction cost of about three to $4 billion for a typical 10 mile section, 35 foot diameter tunnel on that. A lot of money on that. And if you have all that money in the bank, then you're looking at about 10 to 15 years to deliver that project from design, land acquisition, construction, and a completed tunnel. Honestly, you're looking at about 10 to 15 years. That's the delivery time on this type of major project. All right, thank you. Our next question is for you as well, Scott. Will tunnels be planned under the existing channels as depicted in the visuals or will they be under existing structures like homes, buildings, or roadways? Great question. The big advantage, one of the big advantages, there's a lot of advantages, but one of the big advantages of the tunnel is that reduction in land acquisition. It goes into how quickly we can deliver tunnels. It goes into the impact on the community. Um, so that reduction in land acquisition is a very, very big advantage of tunnels. And to maximize that reduction in land acquisition, yes, we will try and locate the tunnels to the biggest extent possible under existing channels, under existing public rights of way, much like you see on the, the channels, on the exhibits. Now, that said, it's not going to be 100%. There will be some areas in the future that you might have to acquire land. Um, looking at one of our representative tunnel alignments, if we had tried to achieve the same level of service with our traditional methods, we would take about 2,483 acres of land to build channel stormwater detention basins, to build channel improvements, to build those type of, of items. And in that alignment, a tunnel could do the same thing in about 27 acres. So you can see it's a much, much greater reduction in land surface uh, impact on that. So yes, we will maximize the use of the existing rights away, channel rights away as much as possible. 
All right, thank you for that. You all might note that we are nearing the close of our meeting, um, but we have more than 200 of you on tonight and we want to try to get through as many of your questions as possible. So I'm going to keep going with I hope your virtual permission um, and we'll get through as many of these questions as we can. So with that, um, Tommy Joe, our next question is for you. I assume that with further input and study, some tunnel segments might be modified or removed. Is it possible that some additional tunnel segments could be added to the system or some watersheds revisited for inclusion? So the answer is yes. Um, so we're still in the concept, those eight tunnels that you saw previously, those are still a conceptual level right now. Um, there is still phase three where we're gonna go in depth further of investigating how the watersheds work together um, and actually doing more detailed modeling in the next phase. So that will give us more information about how the tunnels are working and whether we need to either shorten or lengthen, make change the diameter, or actually put the, the tunnel in a different location. So more, more to be determined next. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. All right, Scott, can you elaborate on how flood benefit areas were determined? In some of these areas, there are already projects underway. How did that factor into the analysis? Sure. Um, our flood damage centers were determined by, first thing we did was we did a countywide 2D rain on grid model. So the latest hydrologic hydraulic modeling that's out there and the stuff that's also serving as part of the basis of our MapMex program on that. But we did this 2D modeling. We also took a look at FEMA claims for flood insurance, the instances of flooding that have been reported to flood control historically, and the instances of flooding that we have identified when we do our post-storm damage assessments on that. So combined that advanced H and H, hydro hydrologic and hydraulic modeling, plus all the historical instances of flooding that we were able to identify came up with the flood damage centers. Yes, we have had a lot of projects built in a lot of areas in the county in that. And we did incorporate those projects that were built or that were nearing completion or that were in progress in our analysis, yes. All right, thank you. Tommy Joe, our next question is, what about the quality of water that flows out of so many tunnels into the bay? Have you investigated the impact of the polluted water to be discharged? Tommy Joe, I can take that one if you wish. Sure, sure. Sure. The thing about the water that's going to the bay is that water will get to the bay, whether it goes through a tunnel or whether it goes through the above ground channel on that. So the water gets to the same location. It does possibly change the timing, how long it takes to get to that location. But in general, that water would not be running over ground or water that's in a tunnel is not running over ground and collecting some of the additional pollutants that it might collect running further over ground. But we have in the appendices of our study, and it is on the report, we have done some preliminary environmental alert work. We also have a major component of environmental work planned for our phase three to look at a lot more detail on the environment. As we said in the presentation, we cannot have a negative impact on the receiving water body. That is very important to us, whether that's a, a increase in water surface elevations that we can uh, mitigate, whether that's uh, a pollution issue, whether that's a sedimentation issue, whether that's a scour and erosion issue. Those are all items that we need to look at as part of our phase three study. But there is some preliminary environmental information in the appendices to this report. All right, Scott, you just mentioned phase three. What's the estimated completion date for phase three? You know, it's a big task. Phase three is a big task and there, there's no doubt about it. Um, we've got a lot of work to do. We've got, um, basically we're looking at three years. That's our current estimate for the next phase of the study to go through. Uh, it's just a lot of work. We have a lot more detailed information. We have to get a lot more engineering information. We got to get a lot more 
benefits information and we got to do a lot more of federal processes and and environmental work to get it going. All and, right. And Scott, I, or sorry, Sparkle, I was going to ju jump in and just say that um, on our website, and I know we have it um, shown somewhere on the end, um, that's where we actually post our updates and that's where we'll be coming back and saying, hey, this is what's going on. So as we get more information about that schedule, we'll, we'll definitely be update, coming back to the public and, and giving those updates. Yes, and that website is also a great resource. This presentation that you viewed tonight, along with a video uh, recording of the presentation tonight, will be posted there, um, as well as the study for you to review. All right, our next question is for Scott. What is the Flood Control District's plan for flood prone air flood prone areas where a tunnel is not suggested? We are always looking at ways to improve the flood risk in Harris County on that. All the tools remain in our toolbox that we have to date. Channel improvements, stormwater detention basins, um, floodplain preservation. We're also looking at, at other options. We're, we're in, the, in different areas, but every tool that's in our toolbox currently remains in our toolbox for all the areas of Harris County. Tunnels would not replace any of our traditional tools. They're a complement to our traditional tools that we have in our toolbox. So we'll have to continue all of our processes that we currently do. All right, Scott, at this point, what can you tell us about possible funding sources for the local share of tunnel project? Um, the easy answer would be, you know, it depends. Um, but the answer is, there would probably have to be, even if we manage to get federal funding, federal funding usually has a local match. Um, normally that's about a 65% federal, 35% local. So we would have to come up with that local match. Phase three is going to look at potential funding sources, but it ranges from you know, bond programs to various other methods. We're just not really able to to detail anything yet until we go into more detail on it in phase three. All right, and Broderick, we see your question about the study. The study along with the video and the presentation from tonight's meeting will be posted in the coming days on that site. So we know you're looking for it and we know you're eager to get your hands on it and it will be posted on that website. All right, uh, Scott, would you expect to construct one to several tunnels at a time or start all tunnels at once? Hey, uh, I'm an engineer. Let's build everything. If we had the fund, we'd love to build everything. But in reality, this is a large lift. This is a lot of funding um, that is going to be required. Um, what we're going to be looking at is trying to advance all eight potential tunnel system alignments with whatever modifications that phase three come about and then have that completed project and then as targets of opportunity come up with funding, whether there's a federal grant or a federal opportunity or congressional allocation or state funding or local funding, then we would advance tunnels as that funding is available on that. All right, Tommy Joe, what type of protection would neighboring areas, a neighboring area around Galveston Bay have to, to make sure additional flood waters won't flood them? Well, I, I, I can chime in on that. Part of our phase three analysis is to take a look at how the flows of the tunnels interact with other projects in Galveston Bay, such as the Coastal Fine Project and how it interacts with that. But we are committed as a no adverse impact agency to not shift a problem from point A to point B. That is not what we're in the business of doing out here and we, we take that to heart. Um, so we can, you can rest assured that anything from our tunnel study would be accounted for and fully mitigated without creating a, any additional problems. That is the commitment we have. That is part of our, our mantra that we follow, but it is not what we do. 
All right, Scott, um, can you please explain in more detail what was meant by the tunnels avoiding 80,000 to 120,000 future instances of flooding over a hundred year period? Is that a structure count or does it count structures more than one? That is what we call the cumulative instances of flooding. And so that means some of those structures might only flood once because it's in a relatively high performing watershed that structures don't flood until a 25 or a 50 year storm. But we also have a number of very low performing watersheds where structures flood in much more frequently than that in much smaller storms. So that is cumulative instances of flooding. That is both all the structures that flood once all the way up to a hundred year event or structures that might flood multiple times all the way up to that 1% or 100 year storm event. So yes, it is cumulative instances of flooding over the service life of the tunnel system, which is 100 years. That's what it's designed for. Um, but again, there would be additional structures, tens of thousands that would be benefited over and above that 80 to 120,000 that would see less frequent or less or reduced levels of flooding with these tunnels. And that's still to be quantified. When we talk about phase three, that we got to continue to quantify those business, those benefits, that's going to be detailed in a lot more, more detail. All right, Scott, several viewers are wondering how such a flat county can move stormwater through a tunnel. Is there sufficient elevation in connection with all these tunnel alignments? Yes, and I don't know the slide number, but if y'all want to go back to the slide with the cross section of the tunnel, Tommy Joe, you know slide numbers. Uh, that one, yes. So you can see that difference between the outlet elevation and the inlet elevation, the inlet on the left, the outlet on the right. That difference is what pushes the water through the tunnel, that, that elevation difference. And that does is part of the reason that some of the more coastal areas, the more low-lying areas of the county, tunnels just weren't effective because you did not have that difference in elevation to really push any significant amount of water through the tunnels. So yes, we are relatively flat, but if you look from the, the northwest to the southeast side of the county, we have about 244 feet in elevation, and that does provide sufficient driving force to push the water through the tunnel on that. But yes, it is areas of the tunnel that elevation was an issue with the viability of tunnels. Areas of the county, I think I said tunnels. Mm -hmm. All right, Scott, why doesn't the flood control district use pumps now to move more water? As I said, uh, part of phase three is looking at active stormwater management, which could look at we're gonna look at the benefits of having a pump conveyance as part of it. Uh, there might be times where we could reduce the size of the tunnel, but maintain the same conveyance with a pump system on that. And so that is gonna be part of our analysis in phase three. Phase two, we base it on gravity. Phase three, we'll take a look with pump conveyance and see if that does provide any advantages or benefits. All right, and we're seeing a lot of really detailed engineering questions. I wanna remind you all that any comments not addressed during tonight's meeting will receive a response following the close of the public comment period. Tommy Joe, our next question is for you. Will the tunnel alignments follow the channels or be more directly linear to the outlet? Um, also, will surface property rights need to be acquired or will it follow public right away like freeways? Okay, so there's two parts. So the first part was about will the alignments follow the channels. So as you see here, um, in general, that is the plan is that they will they will follow the channels. Now channels bend, <laughs> they they wind and and they don't necessarily go through um, go on a very super linear path unless it's a man made channel. So with a tunnel, you can't necessarily bend a a, a, a tunnel as many times as you may bend a, ch um, bend a channel. And I think I just rep repeated, but a t you cannot bend mm -hmm. a tunnel as much as, you, as nature can bend a channel. And so, yes, there will be some, some acquisitions that will be needed, 
but for the most part, we're trying to keep it entirely within the existing right of way. That mean, may mean partnerships with other local agencies um, to try to make sure we are avoiding private property. Um, and we definitely will need to get subterranean easements if, if we're trying to get on a property, for example, on a partnership project, a partnership property. Um, and again, that's where the, the tunnel will be deep underground um, and not so much as the surface. All right, um, question for you, Scott. Would FEMA participate in funding considering that losses FEMA would need to address in the future would decrease as a result of the project? Um, sorry, I had to check, make sure I wasn't muted. Um, we will leave no stone unturned when we comes to funding. Um, we will investigate all possible sources of funding at state, federal, and local levels to see about implementing the system. Um, I'm not going to be able to say today whether this is something that FEMA is, is you know, going to say it's right up our alley, um, but it is something that we're looking at. Phase three and investigating funding sources is, is something that's a big part of phase three. All right, Scott, and we have another question about how subsidence is considered in this study. Could it affect tunnel performance over time? Um, yeah, there, there's concerns with subsidence. There's concerns with um, several different factors, but right now subsidence hasn't been a big factor. You know, we've looked at geological faulting. That, that's also a factor we've been looking at as part of this. Um, more to come, phase three, but right now we don't see a subsidence as a deal killer on the implementation of a tunnel system. All right, and we have a question from someone about um, will the responses be sent to the specific authors of the questions? Yes. Um, if you have uh, given us a question tonight and you did not receive a response, or even if you actually did hear a verbal response, we respond to everyone that participates in the meeting and that provides a question following the close of the public comment period. All right, and with that, I'd like to share one final reminder that we are continuing to accept comments and feedback on this study through September 30th. We also encourage everyone to get flood insurance as flood season in Harris County runs year round. Thank you again for joining us this evening and for your engagement with this study. We look forward to continuing to share updates as our work